Professor Karin, thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed by us about the range of political and economic issues uh, facing Europe today. I am Silvana Tarlea and this is Aileen Keller and we are both Max Weber Fellows in Politics. And Wendy Carlin is Professor of Economics at University College London and a Research Fellow of the Centre for Economic Performance. She has been a co-managing editor of the journal Economics of Transition for more than a decade. And Professor Carlin has also co-authored three macroeconomics books with David Soskis. Further to this, she has researched uh, institutions and economic performance and economics of transition. You have covered important ground in your work and we will only touch upon parts of it today. Uh, our questions will focus on the functioning of European economies, on the divides between the North and the South, and the West and the East. And Eileen will start with the questions, and then I will take over, and then we will switch back and forth. Great. Okay, so thank you, Professor Carling, for being with us here today. We would like to start off with a bit more of a personal question. Because we were wondering how you, as we understood, correct, understood correctly, growing up in Australia, got interested in the functioning of European economies. You started out your work um, with your dissertation project on Germany. You moved on to Eastern Europe and transition economies. You've recently been working on the Euro crisis. So what is motivating your research? That's a very good question. Um, I, I think, I'm not sure that there's a simple answer, but, but when I came to do my uh, graduate work in Oxford, I, uh, I was realized that I wanted to do applied economic research, and that I was in the UK, about which I knew very little, um, uh, and I thought that it would, it, it would be very important to work on a European topic. And I was very attracted to work on Germany because I had some understanding that the German economy worked in different ways from the British economy. So I thought, here I am in, in the UK, but I would like to become um, well informed about the German economy. And there also seemed to be a gap in the work of economists, especially at that time, in a kind of analytical understanding of how the German economy works. And from then you moved, or you moved on to other... Yes, I, and th that became part of a, um, a long-term project in macroeconomics where I've been working with David Soskis over many, many years. Um, and Germany was always part of that work because our idea was to develop uh, ways of teaching macroeconomics, not just to economic students, but also to, to political scientists and other social scientists that was rooted in the way uh, contemporary economies operated. And having this contrast between the British economy and the German economy um, was extremely useful in, in the first book, in, which was very much centered on the way labor markets work. They work very differently. And from there, I uh, also developed, um, uh, really coming out of my dissertation work on Germany, which was about a large-scale transformation after the Second World War. Then, uh, when uh, reunification took place, it was a it seemed like, how much luck could you have that, that you, would, you would really be witnessing a, a surprise, a shock, which are kind of central to the way economists think. And you very, it's very rare that you have an unanticipated event, and especially a large-scale institutional transformation. So I then um, became fascinated with what was happening, especially in East Germany, because of my knowledge of West Germany, but also more broadly. And that extended my interest from really macro and labour markets into corporate gov governance. And the, many of the interesting issues in the transition were to do with, um, with privatisation, corporate governance, and so a whole, a whole different area of, of economics um, to, to, to kind of get, get to grips with. So you mentioned the transition economies, and I have in mind a 2013 article, so article of yours in which you talk about the long-run legacies of communism and about the advantages and disadvantages that stem from centralized planning. So I was wondering whether you think that these uh, Central and Eastern European countries uh, continue to be fundamentally different from the rest of, of Europe today. 
I, this is very, very interesting. And what, what we were trying to do was to find out whether being separated from the, the global economy, separated from uh, the rules of a market economy for an extended period, uh, affected long-term long development. And to answer that question, we had to figure out what the basis of, of comparison was. Yeah. And it became clear, or what, what came out of the research, was that the countries that did relatively well out of their experience with central planning were countries that, at, at initially low levels of economic development and low levels of you know, industrialization. And central planning was able to provide, for example, an, ed an education system. It was able to provide electrification, which when we compare the, the peer countries with those economies, they're often still struggling to establish effective systems of education and, um, and infrastructure, especially electricity. But if we take the more advanced, the countries that already had education systems, the, say the central European economies, the countries that had already been industrialized, and then they got planning, they, uh, they did worse relative to their market economy peers. So that the, the gaps that can be filled by planning appear to be relevant to early stages of development and not to later ones. And when we then have this, this fascinating um, repositioning of those Central and Eastern European economies back within their geographical and institutional peers after the fall of communism, then it's very interesting to see uh, how quickly they're able to readjust to the market economy. And uh, I think you know, we, we've learned a lot over this period. And many of the questions, in my view, still remain to be addressed. So I think it's a, it's a really fertile research area. Um, there are lots of countries, there are big variation in policies that were implemented. And the linking of how, how countries are faring to how well they performed before planning, I think is, uh, is insightful about, for example, the way in which um, networks of production and specialization have been re-established after the transition. Yeah, and actually some, some of these countries have now become part of uh, the EU and the yeah. Eurozone, and do you think that this might uh, make it easier for them to uh, adapt and to, to catch up in terms of economic development, sophistication? I think for, for those economies that have been able to fit very well into the production networks yes. within, uh, within Europe, so I think Germany is a very classic case where uh, large companies in Germany recognised rather early on that uh, the opening up of Central and Eastern Europe represented an opportunity, but that they had to think strategically about how to make use of their their locational institutional advantages at home with these new opportunities in neighbouring countries. Yeah. And uh, where, where that, uh, that match, where that complementarity has been strong, then uh, uh, there's been quite effective economic development. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it's been driven more by the decisions of important companies, especially, uh, especially in Germany, than it has for example, by particular um, uh, effects of the European Union or policies of the European Union. But you know, the overarching framework of the European Union has, has made many of these, um, uh, sort of cementing many of these networks easier. So there's not much space for the state, do you think? Well, I, I think to, to really understand what, what's happened in along the lines that we've been mm. talking about, I think you do need to understand the decisions at firm level. Yeah. So it's not a so top-down um, interpretation, I don't think, is going to really uncover why the particular, for example, the particular regions, the particular industries that have flourished have done so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then, then, so, if we talk about the ways in which firms uh, co coordinate or cooperate, mm -hmm. and, and we probably also talk about some former rules. And then we, if we think about the way in which behavior is affected by these former rules, do you think that this differs in any way in in Europe 
at large. So between, I don't know, in the north and the south, mm -hmm. or the east and the west, and whether yeah. you've seen any such differences. Yeah, so, so one, one, one of the interesting challenges, I think, and something that, that I talk about in the lecture, is to to figure out why when different parts of of, of a, a country say so that you've got form similarity of formal institutions why is that that you have persistent uh, failure of convergence or even divergence mm -hmm. and the, the the cases that um, I think are interesting to contrast are the Italian case with persistent failure of the mezzo giorno to converge and then the East German case, where you have, where you had a, a unified country with very similar living standards. Then you have the planning experiment separation. The East falls behind. You have unification, and the question is, what happens? And there were many predictions at the time that you'd have a mezzo giorno. And uh, the to to interpret what's happened, I think you do need to think about institutions and culture, and that where these are very different in the two different parts of, of, of the economy, when you integrate the parts, then each part will specialise, if you're thinking of tradable goods, in producing the goods most complementary to their institutions and culture. So they'll, they'll specialise, they'll gain from that specialisation, but that will make it harder for, for the, the weaker region to, to catch up. So there's a kind of paradox because we, sort of at, uh, on a first order, think that integration will promote convergence. Mm -hmm. But if we have, I think it's, it is this microeconomic level of understanding, if we have differences between the, the, the institutional arrangements, for example, the decisions that are taken by managers of firms, and then the response, the behavior or the culture, of workers responding to that, then we can see very different kinds of production. So I talk about it in terms of the ability to produce opaque goods where you need trust and the as compared with the ability to produce transparent goods which use just simple labor if you like. Mm -hmm. So if you unless you've got the right combination, the right convention, then you you can't produce the 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 more complex goods, you're never left gaining from specialising in the simpler goods. Yeah. So the cost of you exiting to the higher or the, the, the better convention go up. So it then comes the you know then you say okay this is all this low down decentralised stuff. But then in 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 some sense comes the role of the state because if you have sufficiently effective policies, then you can you can jump the the uh, the region with the weak convention to to the stronger convention, but that's a very difficult thing to do. And I think these looking at case studies is a way of trying to understand the circumstances in, under which that can happen. And then does the quality of governments matter in this in this respect? And I was just if I want to be a bit uh, polemical, do you think there's any chance that some of this uh, weaker countries uh, in, the, in the East might become a future Greece? Uh. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, 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 I think there are, different, there are different issues. Greece raises different questions, um, where there was clearly a, a very serious pro problem of governance. It, it was a, a, a very weak state. There was severe fiscal failure. Uh, I don't think that's a general interpretation of the background to the Eurozone crisis. And I think that for the other countries, so we can kind of in some sense set, set Greece to one side, uh, in terms of these arguments about trade and specialisation, which I think is a much more general argument, and uh, there I think uh, the, the problems are not simply uh, weak governance of the kind that you can sort of try to do something about by imposing rules about meeting budgetary targets. I think it's much, these questions of uh, institutions and culture and, and specialisation are deep and the ways of dealing with them um, are, are quite difficult to identify.
Yeah, we've already started talking about the Eurozone and the Eurozone mm -hmm. crisis. Um, you and also others highlight um, differences in the growth models as one of the deeper lying um, causes of the Eurozone crisis. I would be curious to find out more from a theoretical perspective of how you would describe what you call conventions or traditions. What is it um, and how does it influence behavior? Is it like worldviews, the script that people have? Or what is it as a variable um, that you can observe and study? Mm -hmm. So, well, I think so that covers a very wide <laughs> ground. But uh, So just think of a very simple example of, um, of a manager of a firm. Mm -hmm. So the, the one way of thinking about it is whether, whether uh, the manager uh, has a relationship with the workers where, where, for example, through a works council, there's considerable discretion given to workers because they're involved in creating complex products and they have to make certain uh, judgments of their own. So the workers have to respond to that, if you like, delegation from, from, from the management through that kind of institution by cooperating. Right? So that's a combination of a particular institutional rule and a, a behavioral or cultural response. And you could have, have, have a different situation where you have a hierarchical management structure basically telling the, the uh, workers what they have to do in a production process and the response to that will be somehow resistance on the side of, of uh, workers. So the second is the situation where there's a lack of trust. So this is just one example of where you can link the combination of institution, behavioral response, type of specialization into, into two separate groups that can both survive in, a, in an integrated trading uh, situation. So, so that's an example. So basically what you're saying is that very often the former institutions and the cultural historical heritage mm -hmm. go in some way together. And if we think about the Eurozone, well, they kind of change cultures or um, mm -hmm. well, history or like the traditions of these different member states. What we can change is the formal, formal rules of the game. By looking at the Eurozone, yeah. a lot of change, a lot of reform has been happening recently. Can those um, reforms modify the way those economy works um, to produce more convergence, which would be necessary, or is it just the limits? Or in other terms, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think I mean what what I, I, it's not an entirely pessimistic um, perspective, but I think that the creation of the eurozone itself was problematic. So I think that it was a step too far to think that countries with very different combinations of institutions and cultures could operate satisfactorily with a common currency. So I think that. Uh, there are, there are, uh, there's a. Uh, what's contributed, if you like, if you if you have countries in a um, in in the European Union with open trade and, and so on, um, having different currencies allows uh, adjustment to take place um, within economies that find it very difficult to adjust directly through what we could call internal devaluation or through adjustable wages and prices, unless that takes place at extremely high levels of unemployment. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it was a mistake to think that by changing the formal rules that would produce the appropriate changes in behaviour. And uh, we saw that behaviour didn't change, and even though the rules had changed. Mm -hmm. And economists tend to assume that if you change the rules, then everyone will understand that the rules will change and that their behaviour will change in line. But the, the experience after the formation of the Eurozone um, should make us think very hard about that, about those kinds of assumptions. And do you think, I mean, what's happening now is basically more of the same in that respect, right? Do you really Yeah, I think, well, you know, the Eurozone is the Eurozone. <laughs> and um, the, the rules of a common currency area are, are very firm. And if you, can, if you do not have institutions which allow you to target the real exchange rate in one way or another in response to the shocks that will be bound to come along, then you will suffer under those rules. 
you might say, well, eventually, you know, if you're running unemployment rates at 20, 25%, then you'll learn. And uh, it, it will be very interesting to, to see what happens in Spain, for example, where they have had extremely high unemployment, they've had a very substantial improvement in competitiveness. But the question is, can they target the real exchange rate outside the conditions of very high unemployment? So this is one of the conditions that you would highlight as one being determined, I mean, having an important role in whether the Eurozone will work better in the future or not. If this yes. real exchange rate yeah. issue can be settled in a cooperative way. Yes, but it's it's a it's not kind of it's not being settled by governments or it's not something that can be settled at that that kind of level because it it emerges from the decisions of individual actors in the economy, firms setting prices and wages, workers responding to wage offers and so on. So um, it's not as if by fiat it mm -hmm. can be decided that uh, from now on. Mm -hmm. and, and the point I was trying to make was that even if you recover your competitiveness through a lengthy period of paying very high costs, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to deal with the next shock that comes mm -hmm. along. So that, that's what I see as a, as a problem with the, with, with the kind of formal rules of the Eurozone. Okay. And it's still possible that voters will not accept all these costs, no? Yes, and that's your, your subject. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, but maybe very briefly, your judgment on the role of Germany. So how much do you think is this driven um, by the understanding of what was right for Germany is right for the rest of the world, rather than maybe to some extent electoral politics, um, or as well, it has been framed sometimes as being egoistic in mm -hmm. um, lowering labor costs, increasing the own competitiveness mm -hmm. on, on this on bird Europe. Yeah. Again, I think that's sort of putting it in a bit the wrong way around. That's as if some something called Germany is deciding to do this, and uh, I think that it's 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 maybe a slightly different way of thinking about it. The the German economy works in a particular way, and there are very important uh, firms. The export sector is very important in the way the German economy operates. And to the extent that uh, government policy matters, it, its role is to create the conditions under which firms will continue to succeed in, uh, in export markets. And if, if that's the way the actors in, in the economy operate, and you then impose some new rules, which is that we're now going to have a common currency, then those actors will self-organize respond to, to those rules and make sure that they secure their competitive position. There are different ways of kind of reading that, but I think that's at least a coherent way of, of thinking about what happened. So it's not that there's no role for, for the government. The government's role is consistent with the, uh, the effective behavior in terms of delivering employment and so on of the, of the private sector. I mean, there is some room, right? I mean, the government could do more to stimulate domestic demand. Mm -hmm. demand. There could be more room for accepting some kind of fiscal transfer, which would, at least in the short run, kind of lower the burden. Yeah, sh the sure, government. sure. No, I think, um, in fact, Germany responded to the crisis in a much more expansionary way. They didn't say so, but they did it mm. in a much more mm. expansionary way than many would have anticipated. And that's because that was quite consistent at that time with the recovery of the, the, uh, of the export sector. So there's, you know, and, and the, uh, the maintenance of employment, all of those unusual German institutions kicked in during, during the crisis. Um, but could, could Germany do more to stimulate domestic demand? In fact, domestic demand has been very strong in Germany. German unemployment is historically low. I mean, not 50s and 60s levels, but it's very low. Um, compared with what it what it has typically been since the end of the 1970s, um, could they be more supportive in terms of fiscal transfers? I mean, they they could take a completely different view, which is that there could be some uh, eurozone level or European Union level um, 
move towards some kind of uh, more you know larger scale fiscal union um, and there are you know there are ways you could imagine that working that wouldn't necessarily impact on the national role of fiscal policy in Germany mm -hmm. so maybe that there's a kind of scope for a more imaginative um, policy space that would is kind of necessary if Germany is to reconcile two things. Mm. So Germany has to reconcile keeping the German economy operating according to its institutional comparative advantage on the one hand, and on the other hand, Germany's commitment to the survival of the Eurozone and the European Union. And you know, the, both those things are very important. So the question is, you know, what's, what policy space is opened up? Mm. And it probably has to be uh, sort of viewed more imaginatively than yeah. has been the case so far. Yeah. I think that's an interesting conclusive point on this issue. Um, so we just thought as a, as a concluding uh, question to ask you about advice to young scholars <laughs> <laughs> from, from the perspective of someone who has been uh, also an editor of an important journal and also for um, other, yeah, so research avenues or strategies that you think mm -hmm. are, well, I'm sure <laughs> that has, have worked for you? I'm, I'm sure you're being very well advised uh, <laughs> here. I think um, being open to collaboration is one of the most important things. Um, the most interesting work I've done has certainly been work with other people and with, with people with, with some somewhat different perspectives. This allows you to, you know, it's really a network effect you then learn about different uh, aspects of, of your subject, you form new relationships, you meet new, um, new co potential future colleagues, co-authors. Uh, so I think you know, this collaborative view of knowledge production is, uh, and it's you know, much enhanced by um, that ease of communication. In terms of the experience of journal editing, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's something that you know, people should do if you get the chance to, to be involved in it and to develop your talent as, uh, as referees. Mm. I think that's very important to see the process of scholarly production from both sides. So, you know, where you're desperate to get uh, a constructive report, you also see that that's part of your professional service to, you know, to take very seriously those assignments. Um, and again, that is often a way of seeing some new things that are happening, that or new techniques that, that take your interest. So that's that's you know, as an editor, I, I've stepped down from the, the job, but as an editor, yeah. this is this is this is on behalf of editors to recruit um, <laughs> outstanding referees. And I must say that uh, graduate students and postdocs are often superb um, referees. This has been a collaboration, so I think <laughs> we have <laughs> tried as much as we could to um, complement each other in, in the interview. And I believe if you have any other questions. Okay, this was really interesting. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, pleasure, pleasure to have you here. And we're looking forward to the lecture later in the afternoon. Thank Great. you very much. Okay.